Okay, good morning, everyone. So we'll get started now. Thank you to everyone that is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar. Everything you need to know about storage for Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Rampal. I'm a principal engineer at Cisco and a CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Alex Chirkop, founder and CEO at Storage OS. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can uh, through the call and at the end. Note the Q&A box is different from the chat box. Please use the Q&A box. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of your fellow participants and uh, presenters. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to kick off today's presentation. Please go ahead, Alex. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, Hope you're all uh, staying safe and, uh, and are all well. So um, just a little bit of introduction about myself. Um, I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Storage OS, um, where we're, uh, we've been focusing on building um, a software-defined cloud-native storage platform. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what a cloud-native storage platform uh, means. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the CNCF um, Storage SIG, um, and we've been, uh, and in the Storage SIG, we've been uh, working on providing uh, uh, facilities like uh, educational content, like uh, landscape documents, as well as working with the, the TOC on some of the items, uh, on some of the project reviews um, uh, for projects that are looking to, to join the CNCF or, or to graduate through the CNCF process. Um, before uh, embarking on this on this startup adventure, I, I've spent 25 years in, in infrastructure engineering. You know, trying to build um, some of the some of the larger uh, infrastructure environments. Um, I'm going to get a little plug-in for for the CNCF SIG storage. Um, uh, the all the calls are are fully open, um, and we we meet twice a month. Um, sometimes it's to cover uh, project reviews and project presentations from the community, and, and sometimes it's to work together on uh, on different contents that that we share through uh, the SIG repo. Um, it would be really great to see um, some more members attend. So um, feel free to sign up, um, and would love to uh, and would love to uh, to talk to you about. Um, the, the projects that we're working on in the CNCF. Um, we had, what I'm going to do uh, in terms of agenda today is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges of uh, storage in, in cloud native environments um, and discuss some of, the, some of the principles of what to look for in, uh, in uh, storage, uh, cloud native storage environments. I'm then going to cover um, some of the aspects of the storage landscape, which are covered from uh, the, the CNCF uh, landscape white paper document that we've created. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about some of the internals of how Kubernetes uses um, APIs like CSI to, to work with different um, storage providers uh, to manage storage within their environment. Um, and then finally, uh, assuming my little prayer to the to the demo gods uh, went uh, was was heard, um, we'll we'll move ahead and have um, a little demo where I can show the use of some of the Kubernetes technologies like um, storage classes and PVCs and PVs um, to run a stateful workload like a database in in, in Kubernetes. The so. So first off, we want to discuss why is storage important? So I'm gonna say something fairly controversial here. Um, despite everything about containers being stateless, there is no such thing as a stateless architecture, right? All applications are looking to store state somewhere, whether it is um, 
consuming, whether those applications are consuming services um, that, that exist outside of the Kubernetes cluster or whether they're using services or storage um, functionality that, that lives um, within the Kubernetes cluster. Now, cloud native storage is, is a very different beast. In, in the, when we talk about Kubernetes, we're, we're very familiar with the concept of pets versus cattle, right? So, so the concept that um, nodes are specially curated and have special resources or special services um, is, is a complete anti-pattern to the way Kubernetes clusters are deployed. Um, what we really want is we want um, an environment where um, your Kubernetes cluster is, is treated like cattle. So, so every node is, is, um, is homogenous and, and, and can be used um, and can be used to, to, to deploy applications. Um, now, in much the same way that today, uh, you know, a developer can use a bit of YAML to specify, hey, this is my application, this is what it looks like, it needs this amount of CPU, this amount of memory, um, and maybe some, you know, some network connectivity. Um, Kubernetes then goes away and takes that declaration or the, that, that, uh, that piece of YAML and, and kind of does a really good job at playing Tetris with your, um, with your infrastructure. So it abstracts away all of the services that are available in the infrastructure and does, it, and does the best to fit the applications in the most efficient way to that, uh, to that deployment. Um, and makes sure that uh, we maintain rules uh, to, to maintain scalability or, or health. So based on the fact that, you know, applications within Kubernetes use this, this sort of functionality, um, you should all also look for uh, a cloud native storage solution where um, the solution is both declarative and composable, right? And, and in order to do this, um, you're looking for a storage system that has, you know, a rich, uh, a rich API-driven process um, that that Kubernetes can can interact with. So, in much the same way that you specify CPU, memory, and network requirements, you can also you should also be able to specify something like, you know, I need 100 gigabytes, and it needs to have these sorts of storage attributes like like replication or encryption applied. Um, the second challenge we see with, with um, cloud native storage is that data needs to be able to follow applications, right? So in, in a traditional um, uh, storage architecture, uh, you're, you're, you're very often presenting volumes or consuming storage on specific servers or, or, or nodes or VMs. Um, and in cloud native storage, um, we have a major difference here. The, the, the storage isn't being consumed by the node, but rather it's being consumed by the application that's running on the node. Um, and a lot of effort obviously has gone into containerizing the application and making the application portable. So this application can now run on any node in a cluster. Um, so you need to make sure that, that the storage subsystem can also um, apply the same rules and, and effectively um, be able to follow the application wherever it moves within the within the, within the data center or within the cluster. Um, the other thing is obviously, since Kubernetes does such a great job at abstracting away the infrastructure, you know, allowing you to to effectively deploy an application in much the same way, whether you're running bare metal on prem or in VMs or in cloud instances, you're also looking for a storage system that can be platform agnostic and work across all of those um, different platforms too. And finally, and I know this is a little cliched, but I'll, I'll go as far as saying, you know, you want to look at the agility of the storage system too. So it's, it's, it's one of the things that needs to be considered because um, Kubernetes environments tend to be more dynamic. They are designed to be dynamically scaled and dynamically upgraded and therefore nodes come and go and nodes um, uh, are scaled up and scaled down. So, so you want a storage system that can adapt to the changing nature of, your, of the Kubernetes environment. Um, and then finally, this is, this is kind of obvious, right? The people uh, are deploying the automation and using Kubernetes um, to automate everything with their infrastructure, right? And, and make it predictable and, and recreatable. Um, so this, this kind of feeds on the, the concept of, of uh, cattle versus pets too. Um, 
That said, because we're looking to automate everything within the infrastructure, we also want to make sure that the automation applies to the storage environment and that the storage environment is consistently available and sort of protects the data within your Kubernetes cluster um, and can also provide um, the appropriate levels of performance and security that interact with the, with the Kubernetes environment, right? So, so you know, predictable deterministic performance um, and, and security that, that natively works with um, Kubernetes access controls and Kubernetes namespaces, for example, are, are, are strong uh, attributes uh, that, that you should be looking at for. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to move into uh, to talking now next about the CNCF uh, storage landscape white paper. The the landscape the the, the storage landscape white paper uh, is a document that we started working on uh, now probably about 18 24 months back, um, and we've had uh, contributions and lots of reviews on on, on the document. Um, and what we've tried to do here is we've tried to explain um, the different uh, components and different attributes of a storage system, covering where a storage system can be deployed, the, the, the various attributes of the storage system, the, the layers and the topology within a storage system, as well as how you access storage and the management interfaces that are used on the control plane for those storage systems. So. The reason why this is important is because storage is a very broad topic, right? So we're, we're, we tend to think of um, storage traditionally as, as, as volumes, but, but in a cloud native world, storage is any way you can persist data. So in, in, in the cloud native world, you kind of have two um, types of, of, of methods of doing that. One is um, with traditional volumes and one is sort of API based methods, which, which includes things like object stores and databases and key value stores, for example. Um, and more than ever before, it's becoming uh, really important for developers to understand the storage attributes of their system and to, and to understand how a storage system works because they need to understand, um, they need to, to to ensure that those attributes match to what their application requires. So we'll talk a little bit about the attributes in a second. Um, the first point is, there are lots of different ways of deploying storage with, within an environment, right? Um, the, the, the more traditional um, uh, hardware solutions are, are typically deployed in, in a data center, um, but obviously some of those uh, solutions have um, limitations on the portability and, and the use of those solutions within cloud environments. Software solutions tend to be more platform uh, agnostic um, and some software solutions and, and some of the projects that, that we're looking at uh, in both uh, commercial vendors and uh, CNCF projects, um, uh, you have software solutions that can be deployed as a container um, and the deployment can actually be automated uh, through an orchestrator too. Um, and finally, of course, um, there are storage services which can be consumed um, from the public cloud providers. So, so public cloud providers provide services like uh, object stores or, 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 or disk volumes too. Um, so we, would, we talked a little bit about the storage attributes. Um, but why is, it important, why is it important to understand what these different storage attributes mean? So when we drew up the, the landscape white paper, we, we, we classified the attributes into, into five different main types. Um, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Um, what we found was, as we were discussing uh, these different attributes is that each of these attributes are important to different aspects of an application. So for example, um, most applications have uh, architecture patterns that depend on a storage subsystem to provide a layer of availability. So if an application needs to move between nodes or fail over, um, it needs to be able to continue to, to access the, the same data, for example. Um, similarly, another, another um, uh, another lever or another aspect that, that that is that is very important for some applications is is scalability. Now, scalability again can be measured in a number of different ways. It could be 
um, the scalability of the number of operations or the throughput of that environment, or it could be things like the scalability of the number of uh, concurrent clients, for example, that, that can connect into the system, or indeed the number of components. So, so does, the, does the system scale horizontally or does it scale vertically, for example? Um, similarly, we talked about um, deterministic performance, and often performance is one of the, is one of the key measures of, uh, of a storage system that, that people want to understand. Um, but again, most storage system topologies um, have a number of uh, compromises on, and they are typically optimized for some combination of uh, different performance parameters. So what, we'll see, what we see is we, we see some storage systems, for example, that are highly optimized um, for low latency and, and, are, um, and are suitable, for example, for uh, transactional systems, uh, which, which require that, that low latency per, per operation. Um, whereas other storage systems are optimized for throughput, for example, um, for things like you know, data analytics or, or, or data warehousing type, type operations. Um, when we talk about compromises and optimizations of the different storage systems, the other aspect to keep in mind is, is the consistency. So um, most uh, systems will have some level of uh, 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 you know, different levers on the consistency attributes that dramatically affect availability, scalability, and performance. Um, and consistency is measured on two vectors. One is um, the amount of time that it takes to, um, to commit the data uh, to non-volatile storage um, once it's been committed. Um, and the second is the delay once that data has been committed to be able to access that consistently across all the different nodes in a cluster, right? And, and you'll find that um, some applications can tolerate eventual consistency um, and some applications need very strong synchronous consistency. Um, and then finally, we, we, we look at durability, right? And, and durability sometimes uh, gets confused with, uh, with availability, um, but they are fundamentally different things. So availability is talking about the ability of um, storage to fail over and to move between nodes and to provide some level of redundancy. The, the durability is a measure of um, the, the way that the data is protected on the back end in the system, the, the, and, and, and that includes redundancy. Um, but it also includes um, additional measures, like for example, the way the storage system uh, protects against corruption on the underlying disk media, for example. Um, so we move on then to the storage layers within, within a storage system. So in a storage system, um, it's, it's now more common than ever um, that uh, uh, a typical environment will be composed of a number of different layers. Um, and some of the layers uh, can, be, can be intermingled from different systems. So it's not, uh, it's not uncommon to find um, different storage systems, for example, layered on top of each other to provide different services or different functionality. Um, at the very top, uh, you have the the work that the orchestrator is doing, um, things like uh, virtualizing the mount points and making sure that mount points and is, are available on different nodes within a cluster, and uh, the 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 integration into things like namespaces and the container uh, bind mounts, for example. Um, another factor to to uh, to consider with uh, Within, a store, within the storage layers is the topology that the storage systems use. Um, there, are, there are storage systems that have a, a very centralized topology, um, perhaps because they have um, you know, some proprietary hardware interconnects or, or they're designed for, a, for scaling vertically. Um, and, and those sort of systems tend to be optimized for um, you know, performance and low latency, but obviously they have the complexity of only being able to install, to, to, to scale um, vertically. You then move into uh, distributed systems, which tends to um, provide much better scaling uh, capabilities by, by scaling horizontally rather than, um, rather than vertically. Um, but distributed systems then have um, additional complexity and additional 
um, latency requirements that, that need to be taken into consideration because the, the, the data is spread out across more nodes and therefore across more, more network uh, connectivity is important. Um, and then there are also technologies which, which often apply to databases um, called sharding, for example, where um, scaling is, is, uh, and, distribu and distribution of data is done by uh, filtering the data into, into different buckets and placing different buckets on, on, on different systems. Um, and the last topology I'd like to talk about is, is hyperconverged, which is, which is something that's becoming um, a bit more common nowadays. Um, and what, what we're talking about here is um, an environment where nodes are, um, are simultaneously providing storage to a storage subsystem and, and, and used um, to, to, provide, um, to provide storage capacity whilst also running um, applications and compute capabilities. The next layer down talks about um, the way the data is protected within those systems. Um, we, we have things like you know, traditional systems um, that might use <clears throat> some, form, some form of RAID, uh, which, which effectively creates parity or mirrors for the, for the data. Um, more commonly in distributed systems, we see erasure coding, uh, which again is a way of, of creating, of splitting the data into, into multiple components and creating multiple um, uh, 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 fragments of, of parity and data um, that can be used to recover the data if, if any individual node goes down. Um, and then we have the concept of replicas, which where, where data is um, replicated in its entirety to, to a number of different nodes. Um, and often this is this is a big uh, this is a big uh, sort of uh, play between you know, uh, performance, data protection, and availability and durability, right? So things like erasure coding provides amazing durability, but typically at a latency cost. Um, and things like replicas um, provide uh, a lower latency um, uh, solution, but typically at the cost of using additional capacity. Now, one thing that mustn't be forgotten is, is the concept that uh, every storage system also provides some layer of data services. So things like um, replication of data or snapshots or clones, uh, which are point in time copies of data, um, which, are, which are typically important for uh, different workflows, whether it's you know, providing uh, disaster recovery or business continuity or providing um, backup functionality um, uh, in, in, in your system. And we can't we can't forget uh, the physical or the non-volatile layer, right? So, <clears throat> um, you know, from traditional spinning media to to fast solid state devices, um, and moving forward to to non-volatile, you know, memory class type components. Each of those components offer um, a variety of um, um, different storage attributes when it comes to you know, obviously performance, but also more importantly, things like durability too. Um, one of the one of the things that's um, that's uh, quite interesting is we try to put a we try to put um, a table in place to uh, to compare the different storage topologies between local, remote, and and distributed systems, and we kind of see that you know the the topology comparison um, affects uh, each of those storage attributes um, by 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 quite, a, quite an amount, right? So um, local systems, for example, are limited in availability, whereas remote and distributed systems have better availability and better scalability. Um, but of course, uh, um, performance tends to be, um, tends to be lower in, in local systems. And, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about data locality in a, in a minute. Um, but obviously, remote and distributed systems tend to have slightly higher latencies. Um, so we move on then to the data access interfaces. Um, and we talked a little bit, a bit earlier on about the concept of um, volumes and APIs, right? So it's, it's really important to disting distinguish between the data access interface, which is, which is what uh, a container or, or an application um, uses to actually access the data and the control plane that, that the, the orchestrator uses to do things like dynamic uh, provisioning of of, of um, volumes or, or management of the storage system. So it's probably fair to say that the most um, mature 
uh, APIs that are available today with, with Kubernetes integration are the volumes. So things like uh, block devices, file systems, and, and shared file systems. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, a, a lot of uh, databases or, or, or message queues or instrumentation like Prometheus, for example, will, will depend on, on being able to use these sort of volumes. Um, but likewise, of course, um, there are uh, a whole suite of storage systems that provide um, object store interfaces or, or key value stores or, or, or databases that are accessed over, over an API. Um, and those sorts of systems, for example, um, will uh, will will typically be using that API over over a network. Um, each of the different data access interfaces are typically suited to um, to uh, different uh, uh, different sets of attributes. So, um, what I'm going to what, what I'm, I'm I'm going to let that settle in for a second and. and you can you can see some of the comparisons on the screen. So so for example, you know you you typically expect um, block systems to perhaps have a lower latency or or file systems um, to be able to provide the, the the ability to to share workloads across multiple nodes, for example. And and, and object stores are are well known for for being able to scale to to very large capacities, for example. Um, but that said. One word of caution that caveats all of this is that, um, you know, we go back to the storage topologies and the layering. Um, we often have to try and understand what is happening within a storage system, right? So sometimes um, if you have uh, block devices, which are typically, you know, um, uh, linked to, for example, uh, a physical uh, low latency device in the server, um, block systems can now, um, block devices can, can now work remotely and can work on distributed storage systems. And therefore, they, they inherit the, the storage attributes of that distributed um, system. Um, similarly, for example, there are many file systems that are built on an object store backend. And therefore, they have the, you know, they inherit the, the latency and the availability and durability of the object store rather than just um, rather than just the attributes of the of the file system, so understanding the layering is 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 fairly important when when trying to look at these comparisons. Um, and then we move on to the orchestration and management interfaces. So this is how uh, things like dynamic provisioning work between Kubernetes and the storage system. So um, the, the container orchestrator over Kubernetes has a control plane interface. It, there are a number of these interfaces um, and they talk to the control plane in the storage system. Now, um, in some cases, the storage system supports um, uh, the, 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 the control plane APIs natively. Um, and in some cases, there, the, the, the orchestrator is talking via a framework or, or a set of tools to provide the bridge between the, the orchestrator API and the storage system API. Of course, as we discussed before, um, the workloads talk to the, um, talk to the data plane via the data access interface, which is, which is very separate from um, the control plane interfaces. So you might ask, okay, we've listed a number of different control plane interfaces, but what do they all mean? So the key interface here is the container storage interface. Um, the container storage interface is, you know, similar to the to CNI for networking or, or CRI for for the runtime. Um, is a standard um, API which um, which was adopted between um, orchestrators like Kubernetes and different storage vendors. So so currently there are. Um, I actually lost track, but there's easily 50 or more um, uh, storage systems that support the CSI interface um, that integrate with um, Kubernetes. Um, it's, I'm highlighting CSI because this is the this is the fact the factor standard for uh, interfacing Kubernetes to um, different storage systems and different storage services. Um, in the past, um, we had uh, drivers that were mainlined into the Kubernetes source, um, and we had the concept of, of uh, Kubernetes flex volumes. But the the we it's if you're trying to implement a, a new system nowadays, we should it, it's probably worth focusing entirely on on CSI because 
um, that's the standard where, where all the development and, and uh, advancements are, are happening today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit now about how storage is um, configured in Kubernetes. So, so now that we talked about and we kind of set the scene of the storage system with all its different layers and different data access methods and different control plane access methods, um, what does this actually translate to in, in, in real life and, and, and how are these, um, how do these systems interact with uh, Kubernetes? So we'll talk a little bit first about um, the concept of dynamic provisioning. So you remember when we said um, storage needs to be application centric um, and therefore that enables you know, self-service and declarative um, uh, and composable storage. Um, how is this? How is this actually um, achieved? So the the main abstraction layer here is is uh, is called a storage class. So so effectively, a storage class is um, is a definition um, that that uh, specifies a driver interface, typically through CSI. That that driver interface will be um, will be used by the storage system to provide and manage the storage, right? And this is um, in relation to dynamically provisioning the storage, but also uh, things like attaching storage to physical nodes um, or, or to nodes within the cluster and, and mounting that storage and managing the storage lifecycle. Um, so, so that's all well and good, but what does a storage class really look like? So, so a storage class is actually typically something really, really simple like this. Um, the storage class defines um, uh, a name. So in this class, we, we in this case we're calling it fast because you can create different storage classes for for different types of um, environments. Um, it might specify some some uh, uh, labels or flags that are specific to the storage system, um, and it defines the provisioner. In this case, we're, we're I've simplified it and just and just call it storage OS. But if you if we were using CSI, the provisioner would be would be a CSI provisioner. Um, what this translates to then is how, how do how do developers who are uh, who who want to use that composable storage how do they actually um, register what they need? Um, so the 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 constant here is a persistent volume claim, right? So um, within the definition of your application or your pod, um, you can make a, a persistent volume claim from the pool of storage that's linked to that um, storage class. Um, again, what does a persistent volume claim look like? Well, fundamentally, it's really, really simple. You give it a name. In this case, we're calling it a database volume. Um, you tell it which storage class to use. In this case, we're specifying the fast. Um, and you specify the, the size of the storage. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the access modes in, in a little bit. Um, but fundamentally, all, all it is is you say, I'm going to give a name to my persistent volume claim. I'm going to use a particular storage class. And it's this amount of capacity. It is also possible to pass um, to pass things like uh, labels, which which might affect the, the 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 provisioning capabilities of which might be specific to a particular storage system too. Um, what happens then behind the scenes is that Kubernetes talks over the um, storage interface to the storage system. The storage system creates a persistent volume. So, so we said that the developer makes a claim and the storage system replies by saying, hey, here you are, this is your persistent volume. Um, you then reference that claim in the pod. And when your application in the pod is started, that uh, persistent volume is connected into the pod. So moving forward a little bit, um, what does that actually look like? So, so this is this is an example of um, of a simple, you know, an empty pod that just just runs a sleep command um, and uses uh, a PVC one claim. So, what we see here is um, when the PVC is requested, 
um, the storage system will create the, the persistent volume like we just described. And then that persistent volume is attached to a node and is mounted typically in, in Farlib kubelet and to a, a, long, a long path name in Farlib kubelet. Um, once that happens and the container is then started, that, um, that part in the node is bind mounted into the specified man point, which in this case is slash MNT within the container namespace. So, so the application starts and now has access to a file system or, or that volume under, under, in this case, the slash MNT mount point. Um, if that application then moves to different nodes within, um, within the cluster, um, the reverse happens. The, the persistent volume is detached and reattached on another node um, and then remounted and can be reused by an application on, on the other node. Um, so, if you recall, we know we talked a little bit about um, volume access modes too. So, in the volume access modes, um, we have two typical modes. One is read write once, and one is read write many. So, read write once means that the volume is mounted and accessed exclusively only by one node. This is this is typically the type of um, storage that you'd see from, say, um, uh, block storage services. Um, we also have the read write many, um, and this will typically be used to access a shared file system. So, so effectively, this gives um, the ability to mount a file system on multiple nodes um, simultaneously, and those um, uh, and and you know that can be used for for different uh, different storage patterns, perhaps where um, a common file system needs to be available. Um, uh, to provide, you know, a consistent level of config or a consistent level of reference data to multiple, to multiple nodes within a system. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a very, very quick um, example, assuming everything works, um, of uh, provisioning a stateful workload um, and moving a stateful workload from, from one node to another in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, for reference, I'm just using one of the simple examples that's available on the, on the storage OS um, uh, website. Um, but obviously, you know, you can you can run uh, any application with, with any number of, of different storage systems. Um, with in this particular example, I'm going to start up um, a MySQL uh, database, um, and I'm using the, the free Storage OS Developer Edition, which is uh, which is which is free forever and available um, and available on our website. Um, the stateful set definition effectively um, tells Kubernetes to um, make a claim for a MySQL database and to start it up um, with, uh, with uh, Farlib MySQL in the mount part. So I've already done this. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I will briefly, uh, briefly unshare my screen and I will now share my demo. Um, Sanjeev, uh, can you just confirm that the demo screen is, is loaded? Yes, Alex, looks good. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm going to be using, um, I'm going to be using uh, a little tool called K9S to provide um, visibility of what's going on in the cluster. K9S is, a, is an open source um, uh, tool, but it's it's really great at visualizing what's going on in the Kubernetes cluster. One quick note, so, Alex, so if you could maybe magnify the font a little bit, that might help. Right. Uh, is that any better? That's better. Okay, okay. great stuff. Um, so, so this is this is a running cluster. We see the the storage OS um, uh, storage software is running here, as well as um, the CSI software, um, and it's a you know a typical um, is a typical implementation of uh, of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, we'll focus on the application that's running. So so this is the the MySQL um, uh, pod. 
So before we before we move forward, what I what I just want to show is I want to um, I want to show uh, the pod and the YAML for that pod, which is which is running successfully here. Um, and I want to be able to also, and I also want to show you the, um, the storage class. Um, so we have the fast storage class here, um, and we can describe the storage class, um, which gives you the very simple information to say that this is using the CSI um, API to talk to uh, to talk to the storage system. Um, we can look at the PVC. So we have a, the PVC called uh, data MySQL zero, um, and it's uh, and it and, and it's connected to this volume. So we can also see that volume. We can see the persistent volume here. Um, so this is the persistent volume um, that that claim is using. And what this means is that we now have um, we now have MySQL running um, running uh, with a, in a stateful set on our cluster on a persistent volume. So, as an example, um, I will show you the we can connect to MySQL and quickly show the databases that are currently um, defined. This is a, a blank install, so so this is just a the stuff that you get um, on on a native uh, on a, on, a, on on startup. Um, we will we will um, run a little bit of SQL to create a database called Shop and create the table called Books um, and create a fictional book called CNCF Webinar into that uh, into that uh, database and. We can now um, query the database, and we can see that there is um, the 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 table was created, and the book CNCF webinar was 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 inserted into the database. So now, what I'm just going to show you is um, this cluster is running uh, on a, on three nodes, um, and the MySQL um, the MySQL pod is running on the, the node name that ends in 3uj9r. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the Kubernetes cordon command um, to tell Kubernetes that I don't want any new um, workloads to be scheduled on that node. And what I am going to do now is I'm going to kill the stateful set that's running on that node. So there we go. I've just deleted the pod for that stateful set. Um, Kubernetes is going to see that the pod um, was killed and needs to um, uh, reconcile uh, desired states versus actual states. So it's, it's now going in and creating um, a new instance on another node that ends in 3U J9B. Hopefully that container will, will start up in a second. Of course, this is where normally it takes two seconds and today it's decided to take a little longer. Alex, uh, a few questions have piled up in the Q&A chat. So if you feel like you want to pick one or two at any point. OK. Um, actually, that's that's a good thing. I'll, I'll just finish off this demo now, and, and, we can, and we can do that. So what we can see here is that the, the MySQL instance actually has now started on, on another node. Um, and what we should be able to do is we should be able to um, query the data today's again and what we see is we, we get the same um, the same information back so so effectively what's 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 happened here is the the pod was terminated kubernetes restarted the stateful set um, on another node reconnected the the pvc 
um, and that persistent data was was um, was provided there. So we 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 have um, a system where it using the orchestration capabilities of Kubernetes and the um, and the functionality of, of cloud native storage, it's now possible to run stateful services like databases um, within your Kubernetes cluster and, and incorporate them into, into your environment. Um, and, it, and it also means that, that you can now quite easily build um, anything as a service, right? So, so whether it's a database, a message queue, um, Prometheus services, Elasticsearch, Kafka, whatever that is, um, you can now um, run them as a service dynamically within within your Kubernetes cluster with that um, persistent storage backend. So I'll stop sharing that demo and go back to uh, go back to the slides very quickly. Uh, where are we? Oh. Slides closed. Never mind. I'll just talk. Uh, I, I was only going to have a thank you slide up. So, so we'll, we can go through and answer um, uh, and answer some of the questions. So, so hopefully um, this provided some useful background. I, I tried to make it. You know, uh, I, I only tried to use storage OS as a as an example, but um, you know, hopefully this gave you a, a, a broader. Uh, understanding of the of the storage landscape would would love you to have a look at the um, at the landscape white paper um, and it would be great to um, uh, to 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 get feedback on on that white paper because we're about to to release a second version uh, that's further expanded and updated um, the the there's a question about um, the the meetups for uh, for uh, the CNCF sig um, uh, and for storage OS for the CNCF sig we meet um, twice a month um, the the meetings are in the um, CNCF uh, public calendar. Um, it's the second Tuesday and the fourth, sorry, the second uh, Wednesday and the fourth Wednesday of every month. Um, we had uh, another question to say, can I limit uh, containers to access to spec files or uh, inherit the volume settings? Um, so I'm going to try and interpret that question. So, so effectively the um, the containers uh, will be using um, will be using the volumes, and the volumes, um, just like the containers uh, and the pods, um, are created within the same uh, concept of of the Kubernetes uh, access controls. So, so things like um, namespaces and access to those namespaces and the filters, etc., that apply to those namespaces also apply to the to the to the volume um, abstractions too. Um, there is a question about uh, Ceph and the Rook operator. So, so that's a very good example of you know, the concept of having um, frameworks and tools that, that are helping or, or that integrate with the storage system to provide the Kubernetes integration. So, so Rook is uh, an operator and it's a framework for, for actually more than one storage system. Um, it's, it's going through CNCF uh, as a graduation process right now in the storage SIG. Um, and and Rook can deploy um, a Ceph-based uh, storage system. Ceph being um, a storage system which is fundamentally based on um, an underlying object store, but can provide um, block and uh, and file system semantics too. Um, can multiple containers in a single pod share the same PVC? So the answer is yes. Um, there are two ways that this can happen. If if there are if multiple containers within um, a, a pod uh, can access the same read write once volume if they are on the same node, typically. So this this is something that that some storage systems support. Um, however, if if you want to um, if you want to follow the the storage patterns uh, properly, it's best to use the read write many or a shared file system if, if many containers need to be able to access um, the same, uh, the same uh, volume. Um, provide, we had a question to, set, to ask if we can provide a little explanation on, uh, for on-prem storage solutions for Kubernetes. So, so on-prem, 
um, solutions um, uh, are quite varied because, of course, um, you know, as we discussed, uh, we have some of the traditional um, storage vendors. So, so maybe things like um, uh, traditional physical hardware storage or array type solutions, um, some of which um, have very well integrated um, uh, CSI uh, drivers that can integrate with Kubernetes. Um, but likewise, there are a whole, you know, there are suites of um, software defined storage systems, um, you know, like Storage OS or, or Ceph and Rook, for example, that can, that can be deployed um, on premise too. Um, and, you know, there isn't, there isn't an answer where, where I can say, you know, this is, this is uh, definitely the, the storage solution that you should use for on-prem. The reason being, you know, as we discussed, is that there is a whole suite of, you know, different um, attributes that, that you need to look at. Um, and, and perhaps um, some decisions that, that might factor into the process might be, might be cost-based or they might be um, platform uh, compatibility-based. Um, so, for example, you might find it easier to deploy a software solution if you're running, um, if you're running uh, environments on-prem and in the cloud or some sort of hybrid. Um, but but it's it's something that you need to that you need to understand from from the back end uh, from your back end system too. Um, there's a question to ask: Is Storage OS a shared file system? How does it handle read writes from multiple nodes? And do you handle file logs? Um, so what you'll find is that um, Storage OS can provide both read write once and read write many solutions. Um, and similar to some of the read write many um, solutions, they are provided using using a shared file system. Um, so in the case of um, something like Ceph, for example, it might use the CephFS um, file system. Um, other storage systems might be using um, might be using something like uh, NFS, for example, as as the way of providing uh, the shared file system across across multiple nodes. Um, so so in terms of um, um, how they handle things like file logs will be very dependent on um, the NFS implementation of the underlying storage system. If they're using, um, if they're using, you know, a modern NFS uh, implementation um, and support things like NFS version four, um, then you should be able to to handle state and lock failovers too. Um, is the work being done to provide a more user friendly platform agnostic shared file system approach? Um, I find it difficult to provide a solution that will work on many platforms and clouds. Right, so so that's so that's a good question. I think if you're looking to find a solution that will work on many platforms and different clouds, um, you should be looking at some of the software-defined um, storage solutions that are out there. There are a number of um, CNCF uh, uh, projects that provide um, software solutions, and there are a number of um, uh, commercial vendors, you know, like Storage OS, that, that provide those those solutions too. Um, software defined solutions typically are um, typically are platform agnostics. Although, um, you know, you may find that uh, different solutions might might be optimized or might have some caveats on on uh, different services or different cloud providers that they're optimized for that they run on. Um, can I depend on servers internal SSD was another question. Um, so that's a very, very good question. Um, and this ties into, again, the software-based solutions. So, so typically software-based solutions like Storage OS or Rook, for example, can use storage that's available um, on, on each node to, to provide a storage pool that, that effectively spans the different nodes within a cluster. So um, yes, you can use the internal SSD and, and effectively the software defined uh, storage system provides a, a kind of like a storage persona to, to, to those nodes um, and, allows, um, and, and allows you to turn those, those commodity disks or commodity systems into, into um, a storage uh, service with you know, different data services based on, based on the software solution you're using. Um, is there a CSI driver to allow accessing an object store via PVC? So um, the answer is yes and no. So specifically a PVC, no. Um, there, you know, the, 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 CS, the CSI API is, is focused on providing um, functionality to 
um, access volumes within a system, and, and those volumes typically mean block, you know, file or shared file. Um, there are, however, um, a number of uh, discussions which are happening in the Kubernetes um, storage SIG right now um, that are talking about um, providing um, an abstraction to define uh, access to, to object stores and buckets and things like that um, um, through uh, a Kubernetes abstraction layer. Um, so, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, volumes are probably the most mature abstraction within Kubernetes when it comes to storage. Uh, things like object stores are, are, are happening right now, so you should follow, watch this space. Um, and if you're interested in, in finding out the details, join the Kubernetes storage SIG mailing lists. Um, and with that, we are one minute from time, and I believe I've covered um, I've covered all of the questions in my list here. Um, Sanjeev, did, were there any other questions that maybe I missed out on? No. All right. Um, well, in, in that in that case, I think um, I think we're done. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to to everybody that joins the the webinar, um, and uh, and um, we'll be sharing the the information um, and the slides uh, later on. Yep. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. This was very useful. I learned a lot. Um, Thank you to everyone for joining us. The webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. And we look forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.